morning, a word of life uh, and friends. Uh, welcome to Sunday School for August 30th. Uh, we're still in James. Uh, today's lesson is entitled Two Kinds of Wisdom, and we'll be looking at James 3, 13 through 18, and James 5, 7 through 12, if you want to follow along. Our lesson context, really more of the same, uh, actively seek God's wisdom. Uh, I think we see that in the beginning of our studies in James, we uh, noted a few themes uh, that run throughout the letter. Uh, wisdom is certainly one of those. And so in today's text, uh, James addresses two uh, very different uh, situations, both of which demand uh, wisdom on the part of the believers, us. <laughs> in education, James 3, 13 to 18. A, good teachers, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Uh, by speaking of the one who is wise and understanding, uh, James likely continues uh, to have teachers in mind. Uh, so, uh, you, so you think you, he's kind of confrontational here, saying, "So you think you're wise? Well, prove it. Uh, prove it by living a good life." Uh, teachers' uh, pattern of life must manifest good deeds. Uh, you've got to put into practice what you're teaching. Uh, and we could see uh, the Apostle Peter was also equally concerned with the relationship between uh, good deeds and your lifestyle. And you can read about that in 1 Peter 2. Is that earthly wisdom? Uh -huh. Earthly wisdom, 14, 16. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. I think we're seeing some of that today. Uh, envy uh, is a word that could also be translated to zeal. Uh, it's conceivable in this context that teachers might harbor uh, envy uh, of each other's gifts, uh, and this would result in strife. And uh, all we need to do is look at the church in Corinth uh, to see how that happened and came about. Uh, Paul writes about that in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, and in uh, chapter 1, and also again in chapter 11. Um, if this is the case, there's no reason for any of James's readers uh, to boast about their understanding or their so-called wisdom. Uh, and it says in 15, such wisdom does not uh, come uh, down from heaven. Uh, and he goes on. Uh, James really articulates the standard here that your lives uh, must match your words. Uh, and if they don't, then a part of the problem is if you don't adhere to your own standards and or to God's standards, uh, then it, it really uh, sends a bad message and it kind of uh, drowns out the meaning of the gospel that we're trying to preach. Um, and in 16, he says, where you have envy and selfish ambition, uh, all this should be a no surprise. Worldly wisdom leads to a bad outcomes. So we probably want to avoid that. Heavenly wisdom, 17 and 18. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. 
peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Well, all right then. Uh, it sounds uh, familiar, probably it should, uh, but he's telling us there's a, a better choice um, for the wisdom that comes down. Uh, the reason it sounds familiar, uh, it brings to mind what Paul wrote in Galatians 5 where he described uh, the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and this kind of all runs together with that. It's almost saying the same exact thing. Well, a couple different words, but a very, very similar. Um, and in 18, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Uh, the desired goal of one who seeks wisdom is peace, or it should be. Uh, a harvest of righteousness can be both what is sown and what is harvested as a cycle of peace uh, begins. Two, in persecution, be patient. James 5, 7 to 12. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. Well, James is writing to a group of believers who probably have cause to be angry and despondent. Uh, the phrase brothers and sisters uh, indicates that James' words are not intended for the rich landlord unbelievers, um, but for Christians uh, who suffer at their hands. James points uh, to the oppressed believers, to the Lord's coming as uh, the ultimate uh, solution, and really uh, that is the ultimate solution. Uh, verse 8 and 9. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Okay, so here we hear patience again, uh, just like the farmer in uh, uh, verse 7 of James's audience is to be patient. Uh, this no less applies to us today. Uh, the counsel to stand firm or be strengthened speaks to one's inner resolve. Um, don't grumble against one another. Why would James address this, this about holding grudges and grumbling against one another? Well, one possibility is uh, the people James is writing to are sort of taking out their frustrations uh, with their uh, rich oppressors on each other. Uh, and we see some of that happening uh, today, as a matter of fact. Verse 10, 11. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Hmm. The thing that stuck out is uh, we count blessed those who have persevered. Uh, the, this phrase uh, speaks of the prophets. Uh, those who have persevered. The language is uh, remin reminiscent of the, the blessing found in the Sermon in the Mount, uh, on the Mount in Matthew 5. Um, and then uh, he presents us an example uh, of perseverance and patience of Job. Uh, what the Lord finally brought about refers to the Lord's purpose in allowing Job to suffer as he did. And there's a good reference in Hebrews 10.36 that you can look up if you like. Do not swear, <laughs> verse 12. 
Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. Hmm. Uh, this is interesting, and I think it's one of these verses that's uh, probably misunderstood. Uh, you know, when we hear uh, do not swear, well, we think of curse words. Uh, and, and that's good advice. Uh, there's several other places in the Bible where it does tell us that we shouldn't swear. But I think uh, what he's talking about here is the swearing of oaths. Um, some uh, commentators would argue that uh, oath swearing is most serious or the most serious thing uh, because a broken oath, especially if you swear it in God's name, uh, directly involves God in a lie. Uh, and so I think that's really what he's trying to get at. Uh, your, a yes should be sufficient or a no, you shouldn't have to swear uh, by heaven or by earth or anything like that. Okay, um, I kind of, uh, that verse I, I really didn't like too much because in the King James, when it says don't swear uh, by heaven, it also adds, because that's God's throne room, that's where he, that's where he lives. And then it says don't swear by earth because that's his footstool. And then it says not by anything else because that's all his creation. So that's where it puts the emphasis as far as like, you know, the, the, uh, the swearing of an oath type thing. I think for me anyway, it makes it more, more real. I don't want to like make a vow and, and you know, I swear to God, no, <laughs> not gonna happen. No. <laughs> Our conclusion from above. Uh, the solution is for Christians to seek wisdom that comes from heaven. Uh, as we heed James' call to seek uh, wisdom from above, it says we'll experience a harvest of righteousness. Uh, and that is guaranteed. So seek God's wisdom from above. Prayer. Heavenly Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit this day, help us to focus our hearts and minds on the wisdom that is from above, your wisdom. We ask this in the name of the wisest person who ever lived, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thought to remember, choose God's wisdom. Okay. What do you think? Which kind of earthly suffering seems to vex Christians the most? Why? I don't entirely know uh, the answer to that question, but I suspect it would be, uh, it says earthly suffering. I think lack of control. We all are control freaks. And when we don't have control, over a situation uh, and it's causing us suffering, I think that it probably drives people crazy the most. But as we've seen in these lessons leading up to this, uh, the answer is pretty simple. That if we are really trusting God, uh, then it shouldn't vex us at all. We would be standing firm, as James pointed out earlier in this lesson. You? Well, I would have to agree. I don't, I mean, you could throw a lot of things in there, but it all comes down to control because, you know, you could say money, children, health. Yeah. You have to have control. And uh, that was, again, putting everything in God's hands, trusting Him and His Word and His wisdom. All right. Well, that concludes our lesson for today. Uh, it was a little short, but uh, that's all right. Hopefully you learned something. 
and uh, stay tuned for Bishop, the word coming up. And uh, I don't know if we'll see you next week on here or not, uh, maybe, but uh, I hear that, that churches are going to be open again, but who knows? So if we see you next week, we'll see you. If not, we'll see you at church. All right, everybody have a great day.